Today our presentation is going to be on our ethical responsibility to evaluate supervisees, especially supervisees who are not meeting performance criteria or performance standards. We understand that this is a complicated situation in the context that many of you are working in. However, we have adapted this specifically to the county context and the second part of the video will focus on that. The first will be on the ethical structures, the regulatory structures for the various disciplines. So we'll start with definitions of supervision that involve gatekeeping or managing evaluation of supervisees. Virtually all definitions of supervision embed some mention of evaluation and usually gatekeeping as well. So. For example, the definition in the book that uh, Janine Bernard and I have is supervision is an intervention provided by a more senior member of the profession to a more junior colleague or colleagues who are typically but not always are members of the same profession. This relationship, and this is the key point to our, our presentation today, is evaluative and hierarchical. And then there are some other conditions. And then the last part of the definition talks about uh, the supervisor also serves as a gatekeeper for the particular profession the supervisee seeks to enter. So that, that's fundamental to the definition. And Carol, you and I worked together on other projects, and maybe you could talk about the guidelines for clinical supervision in the health service psychology. Okay. In that definition, again, supervision is a distinct professional practice. In it, it's collaborative. And it has both a facilitative and an evaluative component. And those extend over time. And uh, they provide a gatekeeping function for entry into the profession. So we have agreement on those. The third is competency-based supervision that comes from the work with Edward Chafransky and myself. And uh, in that, we discuss a meta-theoretical framework. And also in that, learning strategies and evaluation procedures that meet criterion referenced competence standards consistent with the context and evidence-based practices. What that means is, for example, the competencies of our profession, the competencies of the graduate school that's uh, sending the individuals to us, particular competencies, or even the setting has developed competencies or SCRP's competencies. I've often used the metaphor of a three-legged stool to describe supervision. Those three legs include facilitating supervisee development, of course, but also ensuring client welfare, which is an immediate task. Uh, that is, uh, that's what goes on during our sessions and, and so on with our supervisees. But then there's a longer range one, and that's the third leg of the stool. That has to do with ensuring public welfare, and that gets us to gatekeeping. We have a responsibility to ensure the well-being, not only of the supervisees' current clients, but future ones as well. psychology, for example, uh, has a form, the verification of experience form, and in that supervisors have to attest that in fact the supervisee's uh, work is sufficient to warrant licensure, that they meet minimal competence standards. Similarly for social work and professional clinical counselors, um, there are particular regulations and certifications certifying that I understand the responsibilities regarding clinical supervision, including the supervisor's responsibility to perform ongoing assessments of the supervisee and declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California that the information submitted in this form <clears throat> is true and correct. Finally, for marriage and family therapists, um, attesting that I shall monitor and evaluate the extent, kind, and quality of counseling performed by the trainee or associate through direct observation, review of audio or video tapes of therapy, or review of progress and process notes and other treatment records, or by any other means deemed appropriate. Note that this is a change in the regulations that happened after AB 93 was enacted. Not so long ago, psychologists were seeking licensure 
uh, sat down in a, an exam that was vignette driven and had really lousy reliability. So our colleague, Emil Rodolfo, who was on the Board of Psychology, took that on as a challenge. And in return for doing away with that exam, he was instrumental in getting the board to acknowledge that the supervisors really bear the responsibility of the final sign off. So I think that's really what these various forms that we've just alluded to speak to. That is our ultimate responsibility uh, to the public uh, and, and how we report our supervisees' work to the respective boards. Gatekeeping is not comfortable for supervisors. It's really not very easy. We have tensions because supervisors like to have strong supervisory relationships. We like to be moved toward a collaborative relationship with our supervisees. Many of them we hope to hire in our settings. And so it creates a tension. Also, as Gazara and Forrest commented, we're trained to be non-judgmental, to be empathic, to accept individual differences. In another article, Gazara and Forrest talked about university internship supervisors and they described the experience of intervening with students who are having problems of professional competences, uh, a horrible, painful, and very sad experience. So it's, it's, it's often very difficult because we didn't enter the field to have to make these judgments. And it's easy for us as supervisors, because it is so difficult, to assume that the next supervisor in the chain is going to pick up whatever problems are going on. So it's sort of like, well, she's struggling now, but I, I, I'm thinking this will get caught later on. The and hot potato phenomenon, tossing the potato down the field. It's the right of, uh, metaphor. Supervisees often are much quicker to identify when their peers are struggling with competence than their supervisors are. On the other hand, they're not always privy in how their supervisors or professors are handling this because of confidentiality concerns and so on. What we'd like you to do is to take a few minutes and talk among yourselves about instances in which you were a supervisee and were aware of a peer who was struggling uh, with issues of competence and what you were aware of being done by supervisors and or professors. And to the extent you knew about it, was it fair and was it reasonable? Effective gatekeeping requires that supervisors have institutional support when they evaluate, especially when areas of the supervisees are not meeting competence or identified areas of lesser competence. University training programs typically have had very clear, clearly stated and articulated processes regarding evaluation and steps that are a necessity for movement toward remediation and termination. But even then, there are worries about lawsuits, about other actions that can make deans and other administrators very reluctant to support adverse actions about students. There are also more local concerns about the impact on the staff, the impact on the setting. So it's fraught with a lot of tension. In public institutions, at least a couple of factors make it difficult to evaluate supervisees who are not meeting particular confidence levels. One is HR rules can make it very, very complicated because there's a balance of protection of the rights of the individual and of the organization. Because this is very specific to, uh, to the counties and departments of behavioral health and, and varies from county to county, we took the liberty of inviting several of our colleagues, uh, Brenda Dimage, uh, Carla Cross, Cherie Summers, and Natalia Rossi, to join us in a conversation about uh, some of these issues. When performance problems of supervisees, depending on their status, but especially if they're, I mean, if they're trainees at a school, that's one thing, but if they're beginning staff members, it's very complex, it seems like, in most counties to deal with that because it does become a personnel issue. And we wanted to get your input on how to proceed with this to make it most meaningful and relevant to the settings where we are. 
it depends on a couple different things for uh, for like public employment. If they're still on probation, you don't have to have a reason for dismissing someone from employment. So usually, what, what's our probation here? A year a for year. clinicians? Yeah. yeah. So as long as it's within the first year of employment, for the most part, you can just dismiss someone for whatever reason you want. I don't know about the other counties. What do you, what do you, the rest of you think about that? We have six months in Kern, but even after the six months, we encourage all of our clinical supervisors to work with the team supervisors because clinical supervision becomes part of their annual review. I'm going to echo uh, what uh, Kern and, and Santa Barbara have said in that um, our, our practitioners are, are often, when they for, are first hired with our agency, they are on probation. Our probation here in this county is one year. And as Carla shared, we can let somebody go for any reason during that time. So once they pass that period of probation, then things become much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some avenues of being able to address some of the concerns that come up, but then they fall under much more constrained human resources rules. And really, when I say human resources rules, that is labor union rules. The other thing that was... The concern is that once any supervisor makes these kinds of moves, a grievance is filed against them by the supervisee, and it makes it just so untenable for them to do anything that they just back off because they don't want the grievance. There's always that, that threat when we're, when we're serving in an evaluative role for anybody that if we evaluate somebody in a in a way that is unfavorable to them, that they could potentially be upset with us. And and fortunately or unfortunately, under labor union laws, the employee has a lot of power to file a grievance in the in the event that we gave them an unfavorable evaluation, even if it was accurate and documented. It doesn't necessarily mean anything's going to happen with it. But now you as supervisor is going to be dragged through the trenches trying to defend your your role as a supervisor, you know, being a gatekeeper to the profession, you're really going to have to go to bat to defend that. So I think strengthening supervisors' confidence to evaluate carefully, effectively, and to document that and to build appropriate remediation plans is going to help strengthen their ability to still hold the line. As supervisors, if we have real concern, probably the place where we can make the biggest statement is we can refuse to continue to supervise somebody. Oh. So if they're not complying with working with us towards a remediation plan and there's not true efforts there, we will give due notice to the supervisee and say we are no longer willing to supervise your clinical hours. We have a what's called a six-year rule in our county, mm -hmm. which is that uh, folks have to license within six years of being hired with our agency or they lose their employment. So there's mm -hmm. some incentive for folks to try to work towards competency and past state licensing exams and things like that. So those are some of the things that we're dealing with here. In Santa Barbara, we have uh, the four-year rules. They have to get their license within four years of being hired. Otherwise, they are able to release them from employment. And in Ventura, they had to get their license within the first um, registration number, which lasts for six years. So let's say they um, got hired when they were two years into that first registration number with the BBS, then they only had four years to get licensed. So they had to do it within the first registration number. Kern has the same rule. It's a six year rule. Sometimes those clinicians will choose to demote themselves so they can keep their mm -hmm. county employment and they'll uh -huh. take like a case manager job or take some other job because they weren't able to get licensed within the time. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that is actually kind of complicated is that our annual evaluations for our staff, our clinicians, doesn't match clinical competency. So we're evaluating folks as, as, a, as a clinical supervisor, those things don't neatly translate to what's actually on paper um, mm -hmm. on their professional record. So that's, that's a little bit goofy as well. They don't use that language and clinical competencies in the performance evaluation document for the most part. They had nothing to do with each other. And so we would get that complaint a lot about supervisors needing to evaluate and assess their employees and there were no questions asked about their clinical competence which is what their job was was to provide clinical services so it was this more generic performance review and so it doesn't help to address the concerns that you might have in their performance evals in kern we 
I think it's been like a little over a year. We develop a supervisee quarterly evaluation form that has the competencies from the psychologist. We review with the supervisees every quarter. And if they are not performing up to standard on that, it will be added into their annual evaluation. And so that has been really, really helpful. And so we identify areas of strength, areas that need improvement, action steps for development of remediation plan, the supervisor's additional um, comments, and also it is addressed how, if we did direct observations during that quarter, how many we did, was it through uh, direct observation, video or audio or some other one? Do we have supervisory discussions, feedback? And so anyways, it's done every quarter. I did ask my administrator if it was okay to share this because I know she said it was fine. be helping them to be very clear about probationary periods and very, very precise and thoughtful with excellent feedback, competency-based during the probationary period. That would be number one. To add on to that, not being overly nice, knowing that you have a responsibility to really assess them accurately. I think some supervisors feel a need to really support and to give them the benefit of the doubt and to mm-hmm. think that they're just green and they're coming along. And so mm-hmm. before right. you know it, it's the year is up and they pass probation and then they never come to be able to demonstrate the competencies that you saw them starting to develop that you had hoped they would have. Keeping in mind your role, not simply as a gatekeeper, but also as protecting the public, that we have a mm-hmm. high duty to protect the public and the cl- future clients. Number two would be to identify specific areas that need improvement and to do it behaviorally, perhaps, and to develop specific plans as much as we can. But it sounds like that might have to be through HR for a remediation plan if it's after the year of employment or six months, depending right. on the setting. Well, you know that uh, even once they're civil service employees, their their supervisor does still meet with them yearly and set performance goals. So you can set the performance goals. I think it's that enforcement when they don't meet the performance goals becomes that's when you have to bring HR in. But certainly the first step. Set performance goals that are consistent with their performance and that yeah. are competence-based and that focus on relevant yes. competencies. This has been so helpful, just kind of getting yeah. the big picture. And it sounds right. like part of it's systemic and understanding your particular system and keeping your administrative folks in the loop. I think it makes it extremely complicated from an administrative standpoint when you have um, like the operational clinical manager, who's also the clinical supervisor. So you have somebody that's responsible for running the clinic and doing the performance evals and doing all of that, but also operating as a clinical supervisor. And it gets muddy in terms of your role. And it makes it more difficult, I think, to pursue those kinds of remediation or disciplinary actions because you're supposed to also be their clinical supervisor and your role gets conflicted there. And I think it then opens up the staff for some vulnerabilities for those grievances and for those challenges about about what you're doing. I think some of the participants believe that it's better to have it combined because if it's separate, there's a loss of control because if the administrative person doesn't see it through the same lens, so Mm -hmm. I guess it's a double-edged situation. Mm -hmm. The question remains, what can we do? And several of those questions were answered by colleagues. However, generally, we need to clearly identify and ideally identify in a supervision agreement, contract, or whatever format is uh, compatible with your setting, what the expectations are for competent performance. So there's great clarity and informed consent from the beginning. Secondly, to provide ongoing feedback on strengths and areas of development. Be sure to distinguish normative developmental kinds of challenges from adjustment to setting and competence problems. So in other words, give your new employees time to settle in and get used to the setting, understand the client population, and respond appropriately. 
Identify particular competencies collaboratively with your supervisee, really based either on the SCRP, competencies from the particular professionals, and provide constructive feedback ongoing as well as praise. It's ideal to collaboratively identify areas that are not developed according to expectations. Consult with peers, other supervisors, and staff to gain different perspectives. Because sometimes supervisees have difficulty with one supervisor, but are doing splendidly with others. So it's important to understand that variation and see that, in fact, it's a common. Then sometimes there are difficult conversations which need to occur about cultural factors, about intersections between clients, supervisees, and supervisors in multicultural identities or worldviews, and how all of this is impacting competence development. So this has been a, a brief overview of a really important topic, and we hope that at least we've got the conversation started today. Thank you all so much, and good luck with your tracking and identifying strengths and areas in competence development.